Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure uh, to have with us today uh, for the Joint uh, Physics and Institute of Astrophysics Colloquium. This day is uh, Jean-Luc Stark. Uh, Jean-Luc uh, is a, a tenure researcher at uh, CEA at Saclay in France and a very frequent visitor here to the astrophysics group for over a decade. And uh, for those who do not know him yet, uh, Jean-Luc uh, did his studies at uh, uh, the University of Nice, uh, where he got his PhD. And then uh, he moved further north uh, to Paris, France, to Commissariat Lerzi Atomique, where he is a tenure researcher since 1994. Uh, his expertise is uh, in uh, uh, astrostatistics or cosmology nowadays. He has been developing for over 20 years novel uh, techniques, uh, applied math techniques that we can use to uh, extract science from uh, astrophysical data. He has done that uh, successfully for various uh, types of observations and missions. His research interest over the past uh, decade or so is focusing on uh, problems which are directly related to cosmology. And he is the leader of the Cosmos Statistics Lab at CEA, for over a lab that he founded for over a decade. Jean-Luc Stark is an expert in this field, a world expert in this field. He has received numerous awards. He received the an ERC Advanced Grant several years ago. He received the EADS Prize of the French Academy of Science in 2000. Uh, 11, the Gruber Prize in Cosmology in 2018 with the uh, Planck team. He also is a member of the uh, Academia Europea. And uh, recently, he, this year actually, he has been awarded the top prize of the European Astronomical Society, which is the Tycho Brahe Medal. And the citation for this medal reads is for the development of novel uh, astrostatistics methods and open source analysis tools which have enabled optimal scientific exploitation of astronomical data obtained from European space and ground-based facilities, leading to major discoveries in extragalactic astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, Jean-Luc uh, is actually visiting us again this summer and uh, we have, uh, in collaboration with the Computer Science uh, Institute of Fourth. Uh, we were trying to attract him so in an era chair so that he will spend even more time in Crete uh, uh, for uh, the coming years. His talk today is astrostatistics from wavelets to deep learning. And uh, Jean-Luc, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. And also thanks for inviting me to, to give this seminar. And um, I would love to be there with you in Crete. Uh, it was in fact not possible, but uh, if you have any question or something you want to discuss, uh, I will be there in July. Uh, so at this point, you can meet. So what I would like to do today is to to, can, to give you a kind of overview of the field of astrostatistics over 30 years and to show you how the ID evolved during this time. So if you look at the history of uh, astrostatistics, uh, as a Greek, you know that everything started in Greece. So with the ancient Greeks and, um, and, uh, and then nothing much happened for many centuries and to the 16th centuries where a new generation of astronomers, also statisticians uh, like uh, Tycho Brahe, Galileo, Lejeune and so on. And, what happened is somewhere in the 20th century, uh, statistics and astrophysics started to be disconnected, or the connection was quite weak. And only late in the 20th century, there are a new mutual interest, and this astrophysics field reemerged. And there was some cross disciplinary effort, like making joint conferences, astrophysical session, and the monographs as well. So. When I uh, got this Tycho uh, Brahe Prize, and um, I tried to learn more about Tycho uh, Brahe. And uh, so everybody knew that he discovered supernovae, but 
maybe that is less new, uh, known is that he also built his own instruments, uh, he built his own astronomical sextants in order to have a better accuracy. And he, and he got, he keep observing the same objects many, many times and repeating the observation, which was not done before. And uh, in some uh, article I saw, they were even considering him as the, maybe the first, the first really uh, guy inventing a database and uh, even the concept of data. So somewhere it could be the first astrophysician um, that was, that was a kind of funny things. And um, so when the astrostatistics reemerged, it was not a coincidence. It also was because there was much more data arriving with the new surveys, uh, collecting more data and new instruments with better sensitivity. And the goal was really to reduce uh, stochastic uncertainty. So the goals were actually the same as when Pico Bray uh, built his own instrument, except this it was more uh, software tools this time. And the idea was to have statistical tool, powerful statistical tool to extract scientific information on big and huge databases. So what's the status now of astrostatistics? So first our organizations have been created 10 years ago, uh, the International Astrostatistic Association and also the EAU, EAU Astrostatistic Organization. And there are also some important organizations in US uh, especially on the, in the American Astronomical Society and also in the um, interest group of astrostatistics. And also there is this LSST organization for astrostats, which is quite interesting. And what happened is there are now many astrostatistics labs in the world, like mine here at Saclay. Uh, and we have regularly astrostatistical summer school, summer school and conferences uh, yeah, there is a seminar uh, astrostat series where you can sign up if you want to, to follow this kind of talks. And uh, obviously, you know, there is a forthcoming summer school for astrostatistics in Crete in July. So, astrostatistics now is a well established field uh, in the community. So, I wanted to start with uh, showing the impact of the first, I would say, uh, really. A big involvement of uh, statistics uh, in astrophysics. Um, it happens in the years 1990, where uh, for the younger who don't remember, but the oldest researcher remember that when we sent the Hubble space, space Telescope in space, that was a problem with the optics. And instead of seeing a star like on the right image, the image of the star was the one which is on the left. So the there was a lot of aberration and the transcript function of the instrument was really awful. So what happened at that time is there was a huge effort trying to improve the deconvolution technique in order to have better images. And that's the kind of result that we got uh, and that uh, my colleague required from the Space Telescope Institute to show me. Is this on the left was the raw data and on the right is the deconvolved image. So we could clearly see that the impact of the convolution was really, really huge at that time. And for a couple of years, all HST images were deconvolved. There was, absolutely, there was um, almost no way to make good science without deconvolving the image. So there was a big difference with what happened before in the community. So we needed really technical uh, statistical tool to recover good images. And after three years, so there was a mission to, to fix the HST problem and they add an optic on the telescope and to fix this aberration and you can see the image before correction and after correction. So the improvement was really huge. And the question was, now we have beauty, we had beautiful images. You could compare the image after the convolution to the new images, which were with a new telescope. And here is what we got. So we have here bottom left, uh, yeah, bottom left the deconvolved image before the instrument was fixed. And in the middle, you see the image after correction. And on the right is after correction, but again with deconvolution. So what is interesting to see here is first the 
fact, the result of the deconvolution was very impressive. If you compare the bottom left image to the middle one, you can see that they are very, very close. And, um, and uh, at that time, they make some studies and they show that the correction didn't improve in terms of resolution, but only in terms of sensitivity. So the deconvolved image before correction of the before optical correction was as good in terms of resolution as the new images. It's only the sensitivity which was much better after this optical correction. So clearly, this was a, a clear proof that the convolution was providing beautiful results. And then I think the convolution become kind of standard techniques uh, used by astronomers. And making the literature a couple of, couple of days ago, I also found that even the Tycho Brahe supernovae was deconvolved. Um, by colleagues here, and we didn't know that, and they were using also wavelets to, uh, to reconstruct these images. So wavelets was already very well considered as a good tool for deconvolving, deconvolving images at that time. So what is this inverse problem you want to solve, like deconvolution? So we observe some, observe some data y, and the unknown is x, and there's a linear operator between x and why, and you have some additive noise that is on the data. So somewhere we want to solve this kind of problem, y minus hx, we want to minimize this equation, but this is known to be uh, ill post problems. It means that it's not a unique and stable solution. So we need to have a prior on x. We need to add some constraints in order to stabilize this equation in order to find a unique solution to the problem. And many problem you have in astrophysics can be related to this equation, like denoising, deconvolution, component separation, in painting, source separation, all of them can be just written under this form. So example of uh, problems like uh, X-ray data, where you have missing data between CCDs and you have a lot of Poisson noise. You have also the the convolution problem you mentioned before, where you want to observe, for instance, a star on the galaxy, and you have a blurring effect with the optical of the instrument plus some noise, and what you get is this kind of image, and you want to recover the fact that it's two objects. You may want to make component separation. For instance, here you have different uh, feature in the image with different colors, and you may want to, to separate the feature depending on the colors. So all of these problems can be considered as inverse problem and linear inverse problem. You can have also sometimes the physics, which is a linear inverse problem. For instance, if you do weak gravitational lensing, you observe background galaxies, and you want to infer something between us and this galaxy, which is the dark matter. And for this, again, it's a linear inverse problem, which can be written in the same kind of equation. So the problem we have to solve is this kind of equation. And what has been done for many, many years is to add a constraint, which is somewhere uh, a constraint on the energy of the solution or the energy of the solution in a given frequency range. That was, has been done for many, many years. And typically the Wiener filtering belongs to this, plan, this class of inverse problem trying to solve, to add uh, L2 regularization on the solution. And then you can stabilize the problem and you can have a very, very easy solution because you can just, you have a closed form solution and, and in Fourier space, it's easy to get it. So that's what has been done for many years. So in the years 1980, there was a big discovery in the math field, which was the wavelets by a French mathematician Jean Morlet and later Stefan Mala and Yves Meyer in the years 19, 1990, where they found fast algorithm, which means that you can decompose the image on a set of functions, which are this kind of shape from the larger scale to the smallest one. So the function is always the same, but it's only dilated and shifted. And you can have a fast transform. You can go from the image to the coefficients through a matrix or with a fast operator, exactly as you do with a Fourier transform. And you can reconstruct from the coefficient with a fast operator, you can reconstruct this in your X. So you can analyze the data 
in the same way as you were using Fourier coefficient, but this time you have wavelet coefficient. So that was a big discovery and it has a huge impact. So to explain a little bit the, the powerful of these wavelets, imagine you have this image and you take only 1% of the pixels, which are the highest in terms of value. And then you put all the others to zero. Then what you see is you have 8% of the energy in, the, in this image. Now we are going to do the same, but in the wavelet space. So you take an image, you transform it to the Fourier domain. And again, you take only 1% of the coefficient and we set, we set all the others to zero. And here is what you can reconstruct. So you see that with 1% of the wavelet coefficient, you have reconstructed 99% of the energy of the image. So that's, uh, that's very impressive compared to other techniques that you could use before. So the whole idea is that wavelets allows us to make what you to compress information. So if you look at the image, the histogram of the image in direct space, you will have this kind of histogram. But if you look at the histogram in wavelet space, now you will have this kind of histogram. And what is important to see here is that it's absolutely not Gaussian. It's more kind of Laplacian law. And if you sort this coefficient from the largest to the smallest one, you see that you have only few large coefficients which are in the tail of the distribution and many small coefficients which are close to zero. And that's the whole idea of compressible signal. You can find the basis where you have only few large coefficients and you have a polynomial decay. And when you have this kind of polynomial decay in a given basis, then you can say that you have a sparse or compressible signal. And now in astrophysics, we have been, I have, especially when doing, I was doing my PhD, I was working with Albert Bijawi and Nissan Salvatore, and we have developed this isotropic wavelet transform where the analysis was completely isotropic in high dimension. And then you can represent an image like this one with different wavelet scales. And if you co add all the scales, you recover exactly the original image. So we have the same properties as what you had seen before with wavelets, but it has a very a completely isotropic wavelet decomposition. And that was very useful for astrophysical images. And it is on this kind of decomposition. That, the, that we got the deconvolution where that I showed you at the beginning. So then the idea was to solve inverse problem with wavelets. So you have the same equation as before, but now for the constraint on X, you say that X is sparse and you represent X in a, in a given space like the wavelet space. So the constraint will have this shape. And what is important here and even fundamental here is P has to be below two. And that's a big difference to everything which has been done before. And the reason why you have to take P below two is be because it has been shown that if you take P below two, then it reinforces the sparsity of the solution. So if, for instance, if you take P equal to one, we end up with this equation. And here, the norm of alpha is only the sum of the absolute values of the coefficient, and that's it. And it has, it has been uh, some mathematical background. We show that doing this reinforce the sparsity of the solution to have this kind of Laplacian law on the distribution of the solution. And, and then you can have a um, fast algorithm to solve this equation. I'm not going to enter in deta into details, but many algorithms exist to solve this kind of equation. And then you can apply them for denoising, deconvolution, in painting, or whatever. So this is where we were in the year 2000. Then some people start to claim that wavelets were, were great, but for some kind of data, wavelets were not extremely good, especially if you have like filament, filamentary feature, or very, very elongated feature, because you need a lot of wavelet coefficients to represent the filaments. And then the whole idea was to find new decomposition where you need less components to present the filaments. And then for 10 years, there was new uh, 
deconvolution, um, neural presentation, which were proposed like ridgelets, curvelets, controllets, and so on. And all the idea of these two presentation were to better represent edges. And um, so for, I would say 10 years, the community, statistical community tried to discover a new basis to represent the data. And uh, for instance, the curvelets I've been working on for a couple of years, you have this kind of basis function and you can decompose your image exactly in the same way you were doing with Fourier or wavelets. You can go from the fast transformation for an image X to the coefficient alpha and to the coefficient alpha to the image X. So you can decompose the image, modify this coefficient and reconstruct an image here. And to give you an idea of what you can do is for instance, if you have this Saturn image, you go to the curvelet domain and we enhance some of the work coefficients and here's what you can get. So you can see that just playing with the coefficient, you can really improve a lot what you see in the image. So that's the idea of the curve transform. So what we, the stat, status where we were at that time is we have many transforms. Each of them is adapted, adapted to a kind of morphological, morphology of the features in the data. And, and then there was also some people starting to try to learn what is the best dictionary, the best space to present the data. So it was coming somewhere close to machine learning techniques. So one thing which was cool that you could do is to play with the morphology. For instance, imagine that you have a data, an image, which is a sum of two components, but where the morphological features was different. Then the idea is we can have a dictionary, a space for each of these features. And you could say that you want to have X1 to be sparse in phi one and X2 to be sparse in phi two. And then you can minimize this equation and solve the problem and having a, a separating the feature in the data. And for instance, this has, which has been done in 2011 by my colleagues with partial data, where they wanted to separate the filaments from the stars information along the filaments. And doing this, they were able to make this kind of separation from the image I showed you before. They extract all the stars and all the filamentary structures in the image. So they could really investigate how the stars are forming along the filaments. That's the kind of cool thing you can do. You can do it in multi-channel data also. If you have different colors, then you can separate red features from uh, uh, blue features. And this is the kind of thing that we have done here. You have removed from this image the red feature, and here's what you get. All right. But then what makes this sparsity ID very, very um, uh, interesting is when we had uh, also a sampling theory. And the sampling theory came with a, something which is called compressed sampling. And this is theorem. And what this theorem tells us is that if you have a signal X, which is sparse, which means that you have only few coefficients different from zero. So if you have n pixels, but only three here are different from zero. And you observe X through a matrix, which is incoherent. And if you have less observed pixels than you have pixel in the unknown, you can still recover exactly the original X signal. And that was very impressive because everybody believed at that time that if you have less observation that you have pixel in the unknown, it's impossible. But in practice, the theorem tells us you can reconstruct exactly X if the number of observables are of the order of K logarithm of n, where n is the number of pixels in x, and k is the number of pixels different from zero. So if you have a huge n, you see that you can compress a lot of information. But there are two constraints. x has to be sparse, and you need to have an incoherent measurement here, which means a kind of a random measurement matrix. And, and to reconstruct x, you need to solve this equation where you need to minimize the L1 norm of X. That's the whole idea. So what's the link with astrophysics? So there is a clear link, for instance, in radio, in radio astronomy. 
you know, as you astronomy, you are observing stars or galaxies which are directly sparse in direct space or sparse, sparse in the wireless space. And you observe them through the Fourier domain, what we call visibility, and you are subsampling the Fourier domain. So you have few visibility here, and you have a full image here, or even a detective. And why it's connected to this compressed sensing theorem is because the Fourier operator is a subsampling, really behave like this random matrix measurement, because a star, which is one pixel, which is here. When you do this Fourier transform, it just spread out the star everywhere. So even if you have few samples, you can still reconstruct the star. And what is this is the whole idea. So you can really improve, uh, reconstruct radio astronomy using this sparsity constraint, and it's really supported by the theory. And this is what we did a couple of years ago. And this is the real data from LOFAR. And then these are the inverse Fourier transform of the visibilities. And this is what the low far pipe pipeline is providing. And here is what the sparsity is providing. So you see many more features in the image. And what was interesting, we can exactly the way that uh, Hubble Space Telescope showed that deconvolution was working, we could show here that compressed something was working because we had a, an image at a better resolution few years ago and we could overlap the contour is a VA image at a better resolution, and you could overlap what you got from LOFAR with a VA image. And there was a perfect match between the two. So it was really the proof that compressed sensing and sparsity was working very well to reconstruct radio imaging. Another very strong application of uh, compressed sensing was missing data. So this happens all the time in astrophysics when you have temporal series or even images. You have to somewhere mask the stars or you have missing pixels in the, on the detector. And if you have temporal series, you have always a missing data because you cannot observe all the time. You have the night, you have bad weather and so on. And um, so here, for instance, you have the spectrum in red and you are interesting in uh, some feature in the spectrum. But if you have a mask, this is what you observe in black. So all the in interesting information is completely spread out. So with my colleague at CA, we have investigated compressed sensing. And here now you have in, in black the observed data, which are masked. And you have here in the blue, um, uh, in red, the original one. And in black here, you have what you have reconstructed using compressed sensing. So we have clearly completely clean up the data from all the artifacts which are related to the mask. And now this technique is really used in an intensive way by different projects like Coro, Kepler, or Platy. That's kind of very standard techniques. It doesn't require any user parameters. You can really put in the, in the pipeline. So another thing which was very interesting with compressed sensing is that it also impacts the hardware. So for instance, if you look what has been done in gamma ray data, so you have these detectors which are here. And because we cannot focus the photons, what people are doing is we put a coded mask on top of the telescope. And the coded mask has the impact of diffusing the photons. So it really acts again as a compressed sensing matrix. And this is a kind of matrix which exists already on board of the integral satellite and the kind of observation you have. But with a new telescope, like the Swarm telescope that you are uh, building and will be launched in 2023, fortunately with the China's rocket and not a Soyuz rocket, so they are, it's most likely that it will be sent in 2023, especially, uh, except if there is a war with China and someone else. Uh, I hope not, but look at the kind of coded mask that my colleagues now are trying to build or have built. And this is what is at the entrance of the telescope. They really try to make it the more random they can in order to be closest to the compressed sensing theory. And that's the whole idea which has driven the construction of this telescope. So we ended up a few years ago with a beautiful uh, approach where the 20th century data processing, which was all about bond-limited signal, 
Liquid theorem, Gaussian distribution, and L2 regularization was completely replaced by a new modeling of sparse and compatible signal, co-presenting something, and nonlinear regularization using L0, L1 normalization. So we could have been very, very happy with and thinking that now we are very good for, for, uh, fundamentals for signal processing. But then, as you know, deep learning arrived and everything is now completely different. And the landscape now is that we have a complex modeling through deep learning and training data sets. We have absolutely no theory for the sampling and uh, we have deep learning solution to recover the data at the end. So that's uh, where we are. And for um, inverse problem, the network which have been certainly the best or belongs the best is the unit um, neural networks which have different layers and uh, I'm not going to, to details, but then it has been shown that because it's very, very impressive whether it can get to this kind of units. What was interesting when I saw for the first time this neural network is somewhere they were not so far from the wavelet idea where you decompose the image, you threshold, you modify the coefficient and then you reconstruct, which was called analysis and synthesis. And the nonlinearity was here. With units, you have also this kind of analysis and this synthesis. The nonlinearity on the contrary are everywhere. There are many, much more nonlinearities uh, compared to wavelets. So comparing units to wavelets, you could say that there are many similarities like the way you, you have different, you have a multi-scale approach, you contract and you expand, you have nonlinearities, but there is also many, many differences. The massive learning through the training data set, the highly nonlinear processing, and also you don't have an exact reconstruction with no network while you had an exact reconstruction with wavelets. So this, all this makes a huge difference. So we try also to use no network for deconvolution. And this is the work that we did with uh, Florence Chouot in my lab. And what we wanted to do is to keep the physics that we know, especially the beam of the instrument. So we, the idea was to first to make first a kind of linear, very simple solution, the convolution, which is quite, which is quite bad, but then it can be fixed by the neural network. And the big advantage of this is you use the physics that you know, the beam of the instrument. And doing this, we could compare deep learning to sparsity. And here in uh, the two bottom curves here are obtained using deep learning techniques, while the green one is using sparsity. So the sparsity one is unsupervised, while the two other are supervised. But clearly, using supervi supervised techniques, we can clearly improve and outperform sparsity techniques. So that was the first result that was really convincing to me in astrophysics. And we have applied this kind of techniques to other applications like um, mass, um, uh, mass map reconstruction in weak, weak gravitational lensing. And this work has been done in my collaborator, Nell Jeffrey and Francois Lanus and Otto Laho. And here it was exactly the same. We apply first the physics we know to reconstruct a mass map, but without any regularization. So the solution is very crap but then we use deep learning techniques to recover the mass map. And this has been applied to real data. And this is, for instance, the, v, the, the Wiener solution using L2 regularization. And here what we get is deep mass. So we can clearly improve significantly compared to the Wiener solution. So you can do even better. You can plug this uh, neural network in a probabilistic framework using Bison neural network. And, uh, and then this is the work that has been done by uh, my PhD students uh, with uh, other collaborators, especially Francois Lanus and Zach Ramsey, where we plug this kind of ID. And what we do here is learn only the derivative uh, of the gradient. And, uh, and doing this, what you have at the end, you have sample of the solution and you can compute the posterior mean and the posterior posterior de standard deviation. So you have also the error bars related to the deconvolution, which was always hard to get with standard techniques. 
So here we have interesting solution, uh, very uh, efficient, and with error bars. So I would say that there is not only the neural network which are interesting with all the modern tools. It's also what we get with the uh, coming with the neural network. It's all the tools for optimization and the fast software, tensor flow, GPUs, and, and dif automatic differentiation. So automatic differentiation is a way to not having to compute the gradient of an equation anymore. So for instance, imagine the Euclid transcript function modeling. So it's a very, very complex modeling where you have the wavefronts, where you have one part that we know coming from the uh, position of the mirrors in the telescope, the obscuration of the telescope, and one, one part that we don't know exactly. So you want to let it free. So you have non-parametric parts. And then you have the subsampling, you go to the free space, and then you get images. And then the final star observation is just a sum of all these guys. So trying to form an observation to recover the wavefront error is almost impossible. Or it was almost impossible in a, in a few years ago. You could not have a non-parametric part. So that's kind of the problem. You didn't know how to solve it. But now having this approach of forward modeling, so we know how to propagate when you have the wavefront error or to go to the image and and then you don't have to compute the gradient and then you can just make standard techniques but we, we don't have at all to care of the gradient anymore and then we can find the solution of this kind of problem and this kind of technique that we are developing for instance in your kit and that's also very very interesting it's the new machine learning tools are results to solve some problems we are not able to do before and you can also use it for more problems, for instance, for n body simulation. So, here is an example of n body simulation, which is done by Denis Angeri and Francois Lanus in my group. And we can see that we can have very, very fast uh, n body simulation. It takes only 20 seconds for a five by, by five square degree screen. And this clearly opens a new way to make to extract cosmological parameters from big data. So the idea is we can try to have a forward modeling and to do a Monte Carlo um, uh, analysis, including the forward modeling in the, in, this, in, in the loop. So this is the kind of thing we can do now with these new techniques. So is deep learning perfect? So some of people believe no, some people believe yes, and there is a lot of discussion in the uh, machine learning community. And there are some papers which are, um, which have, you have to be very careful. For instance, there are some experiments which have been done where guys have been making a training data only with ellipses. And then in the data set, there are some letters which have been added to the image. And then, um, and then the tools, the deep learning tools have been used to reconstruct the image. And this is what deep learning has recovered. While using sparsity, you can really recover much better the features which, have, which were added in the data and which were, which were not in the training data set. So what has been shown is tiny perturbation can, can lead to artifacts. And artifacts may be even difficult to improve to interpret, and they could be interpreted as physical effects. We have to be very, very careful. And there are several papers. So there is a lot of activities in the neural network field now to, to get robust neural networks and to try to robustify, to get more trustable neural networks. And I did myself an experiment where um, we had an astrophysical simulated image that you had some noise. And this is what you get with the sonar wavelet denoising, uh, the kind of wavelets that we have used for many years. And the, the network was, was trained with natural image. And my idea was that uh, natural astrophysical images are also natural image, right? So if, if the network is working with most Im images that you can take, it should also work with astrophysical image. And in fact, uh, it didn't work at all. So you have bottom right the image I got from the deep learning. And if you see, the root mean square error was really, really bad compared to the root mean square error I had with wellets. So 
So here, wavelets were much, much, much better compared to deep learning. So the whole idea here is, yeah, the deep learning was really not trained exactly with this kind of signal and with this kind of noise, and then it was not working so well. So yeah, you have to be careful. So the conclusion um, of my talk is are the following. Yeah, sparse recovery techniques, which have been um, used for many, many years, are very, very efficient. And uh, the whole idea of compress something was also very interesting. But you are in a situation now where you know that our techniques can be all performed by deep learning. And deep learning, but not only deep learning, but also the tools coming up with deep learning, like uh, uh, tensored, fast uh, GPU software, automatic differentiation, all these tools are very, very promising. For, but for with neural network, we need to be cautious. We need to be very careful. Uh, that is a problem of generalization, uh, um, data consistency, lack of theoretical guarantee. All of these have to be taken into account. And you may have to, to have a trade off between performance and generalization. And um, that leads to beautiful challenges for the coming decades for associate acquisitions where you are going to certainly to work on the generalization problem with no network, the lack of interpretability of uh, networks. You want something which is trustworthy. Something very important here, reproducible research. Reproducible research is always a challenge. How can we reproduce the plot in a paper? So reproducible research is even more challenging with no network because you don't need only the algorithm and the script, but now we also need the training data and the training data can be massive. So how can we have reproducible research in this kind of new era where we, for any paper, we need a huge amount of simulations just to reproduce a neural network. And finally, there is another point, which is also important, is frugality. And this point is you are now entering in the, in the era where we also want to save energy, disk, disk space, and um, GPU, um, and everything. And you don't want to burn days or months of GPU every time you want to make a denoising of an image. So we still want to have fast algorithm, maybe unsupervised, uh, to check the results. And that's important. And for this, I would like to finish my talk with this or cameras are aware, it's going to do with more what we can do with fewer. And this is also with the tool that we have. If we can do only epsilon better with deep learning, we should maybe consider not using deep learning. So this is the kind of thing that you should be very, very careful and use the right tool for the right parents. And uh, thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, and look for this very interesting talk. Uh, if people have questions, please uh, raise your hand on uh, uh, on uh, the participant there. Just to see it. Uh, I don't see something yet. I will. I will ask a question. Some some of this we had discussed. Uh, oh, hold on. Paolo has a question. Go ahead, Paolo. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the commercial for the summer school, <laughs> which we are hosting. I'm one, of, I'm one of the organizers. And I have one question and one comment. The question is, what do you use usually as uh, metrics of performance to assess the reconstruction of the image? Like you, I saw you use the RSME. Uh, but do you have something uh, more uh, sophisticated or you take averages over the image? Do you, you weight the pixels differently? So in terms of metrics, for instance, for the convolution, we were very interesting uh, in the shape of the galaxies. So here I didn't show them, but we were also looking at the ellipticities of the recovered galaxies. We are also looking at the flux, uh, typically kind of interesting astrophysical measure. Um, but for this program, for me, what was more interesting was the shape of the galaxy. All right. But uh, what you see in fact in practice in, in, is always the case is uh, generally when you have a better mean square error, you have also a better metric for the, uh, a better result for the other metrics. So mean square error is very often a good metric. All right. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and the comment was uh, regarding your conclusions. I, I heard many times people saying that you cannot trust uh, deep learning because you don't have uh, reproducible results, mainly the things you mentioned. And um, I find it very ironic because this was happening maybe five years ago and slowly, slowly I see astronomy going towards deep learning no matter what. Because indeed we are developing techniques even for uh, machine learning in general for uh, demonstrating uh, reproducibility and conditioning on uh, machine learning. I wanted to know which was your, your personal take on this. How do you see uh, this topic? Uh, I, will, I will say something. You know, in 2000, I think 2005, I showed for the first time the inflating technique. So, yeah, so maybe I can show one slide right here. So can you see it? Uh huh. So you see on the, the CMB image, and the, typically when you have this uh, cosmic microwave background uh, analysis, you are you are um, putting a mask on the galactic part because you don't trust the data you have in the galactic part. So you have this mask, and what I what I and what what makes very difficult if you are looking for a very fine signal in the CMB in the cosmic microwave background, like the ISW, the lensing of the CMB, all these things. These are very, very fine features. And the effect of the mask is much, much larger than the signal you are looking for. So you have to do something. And what I show in 2005 is if you do this kind of sparse in painting, you can just fill up the mask with some data. And you can show through simulation that what you recover that does not impact your final analysis. You can really control what you, uh, your final analysis and you can do your ISW studies or, or your large scale anomaly studies and everything. But at that time when I showed that, people were laughing. And what they told me that they will never, never and never use this kind of techniques. But it happened that with Planck, all the scientific studies have been used in painting techniques, not, this, not necessarily sparse in painting, but that we've been using in painting. So it took 10 years, but when people saw the benefits of the techniques, they were using it at the end. And I think we had the same discussion with, uh, uh, with the convolution at the beginning. The first time I used wavelets and this isotropic wavelet transform, people were laughing because I would multiply the space in memory by six, you know, by six, which is almost nothing now. <laughs> so people are always very conservative at the beginning. And when you get uh, more results, uh, exceptional results, then at the end, you convince them. So now the situation is deep learning is completely new. There are some problems. There are some generalization problems. There are some reproducible, reproducible uh, problems. But I think it's also a beautiful challenge for the young uh, researcher coming up. And uh, I'm uh, completely convinced that in 10 years from now, we will have a lot of astrophysical results and beautiful results which will come from deep learning. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean-Luc and Paolo. Greg? Hi, hello, Jean-Luc. Hi, Greg. Nice to see you again. Thank you very much for the talk. Fantastic as always, the way you present all this material. Great teacher as always. So my question has to do with the fact that, you know, your take on the topic is that deep learning is great, great performance, great results, but we also have physics and physical models. So the, the, my question is your take on how those two can be combined. What is, what is your take? So, you know, in, in lately the whole physics driven machine learning has been very active. So is it using deep learning to replace physical models, to parameterize physical models, to verify physical models? How, how would you, you know, suggest someone try to tackle this problem, this challenge, let's say? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't think I can make a, a global answer to any problem. What I can tell you is, uh, for instance, in this deconvolution problem, Generally, we have a good idea of what is the point squared function of the instrument. We can have a measurement or we can have a model. 
So we have to use it. And for me, that was introducing physics. There were, there were some people who were trying to make deconvolution directly starting from the data and making just one neural network and getting the solution without taking care of the beam. To my point of view, that's not the right way to do it because then the, the neural network has to learn what is the beam of the instrument. And it can be very, very complicated or you need maybe a huge amount of training data that you don't need. In fact, if you introduce the physics, so here the physics is introduced by a pre-processing step where you go from the convolved image to a deconvolved one, but which is a badly deconvolved. And the neural network here is acting more like a denoising operator. So, it, so here is a way to take into account the physics. So any physics that, any physics that you know should be used. I think we, should, we are physicists, right? So, so you have to learn how to introduce the physics we know in the, in, in the, in the processing system. So if I, if I can like capture what you're saying is use physics to capture what we know and then residuals model them with deep learning since we don't know. Exactly. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. And you know, I hope to have a chance to talk about it more in July during your visit. Yeah, for sure. yeah. Thank you. Okay, there is one more question from uh, Dionysis. Dionysis, go ahead. Hello, Jean-Luc. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I just wanted to ask you on a slightly more practical question. Um, I'm working for Kyrax and uh, Mirkat surveys in, uh, we're doing intensity mapping uh, uh, research. And uh, the question is that could somebody apply your uh, techniques, especially with the, mat the, the sparse approach in order to, to clean the foregrounds of intensity mapping? Because you know, in intensity mapping like Kyrax or whatever, you have something like 10,000 more noise than a uh, signal. And the whole problem is this. Could somebody use what you described to solve the issue? Uh, are you looking for the UR signal or what kind of uh, sounds you want to do? So, so for example, um, you have a single band noise that is always the problem that you want to remove and clean your data before uh, using your intensity mapping stuff in a similar manner like you had for uh, CMB. Yeah, okay. So I can just, okay, if the signal is completely in the noise, um, <laughs> I guess it will be difficult to remove the signal that you have, which is at uh, SNR of 0 0.1, for instance. So mm -hmm. what you can do is to remove the foreground from the data. Yeah. Okay. And if you do this, then you will end up with a signal, <coughs> the data set, which contains only the noise and your signal of interest. And then you can investigate the whole <coughs> spectrum if it's compatible with the noise and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is what I think what is done. Um, so sparsity has been used, for instance, for uh, the epoch of realization. Mm -hmm. There are many papers which show that uh, sparsity can be used for component separation. Okay. But it's mainly for foreground removal. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. I can point out if you send me an email, I can point to uh, yeah. papers. Yeah, yeah, that that would be great. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't see another hand raised, but I will ask again maybe a question similar to what uh, Greg pointed out, right? And sort of like try to. Uh, press upon a bit your optimism, right? When uh, when the wavelets uh, when the wavelet bases were introduced, and you were one of the people who actually did uh, a lot of this work, and I was a postdoc, it was really imp impressive results, spectacular, right? But at the same time, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, some of them uh, possibly uh, could introduce a bias uh, because they would uh, selectively it uh, changes the contrast of uh, select features. They would affect uh, the, the noise of the image. So, but however, you knew, since you, you were the one who was selecting the base, uh, the curvelets, for example, what the kind of features would be more easily identified in an image uh, in advance. So you had some knowledge of the possible limitations when you were interpreting the results, right? Now, with a deep learning, since, as you mentioned, there is no 
uh, fundamental theory is sort of like the Shannon uh, sampling theorem or sort of like the orthogonal basis that you develop uh, or the training set. We don't really know that, right? So do, how, how do we ensure reproducibility? This is sort of like the question that I have, right? In particular, if you go, you showed very nicely that you know when you work on the radio data, your techniques work very well, uh, but you and you verified that because you showed it, and then you went to the high resolution sampling and you show that your technique actually does work, right? But if we are always on the edge and we don't quite know theoretically, if I understand it right, right, or we don't know yet uh, how how this uh, how we converge to a solution. Uh, is it is it easy to make uh, spectacular discoveries, or we always need to wait for like a five a ten sigma detection? Uh, so in, in that sense, maybe the deep learning will not really help as much. You see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So so you know, Bayesian techniques have been used for years and years in astrophysics, right? Especially in cosmology, right? Mm -hmm. So the Bayesian techniques mean that you have a model. A theoretical model for for your uh, solution, and here I show the, the Bayesian theorem. Right, so you have mm -hmm. your likelihood, you so the connection between your model and the data, and you have this prior. So in the Bayesian approach, your prior was uh, your, your unknown is Gaussian or whatever Laplacian mm -hmm. or any model of the dust, for instance. Uh, in Planck, they had a full modeling for all the components of the sky. So you can have this kind of model, and then you can derive using HMC or uh, can derive your solution. But obviously, your, the quality of your solution was depending on the quality of the model, right? Mm -hmm. So here, this deep learning, in fact, is similar, except that the model is not coming from an analytical model. Okay, you don't say that, for instance, the dust follow a power law, uh, a straightforward power law. Uh, what you said is you have simulation which represents your data. So your model is represented by the simulation. So you're a, a, a very, in a very similar way to what has been done for years with the Bayesian approach uh, and the modeling. Here, the modeling is coming from the training data. So your solution will be always as good as the training data, data set will be good. And if you have something which is absolutely not seen in the training data, then you may completely miss it. In your analysis, mm -hmm. um, for, um, remember the discovery of the gravitational waves. They had two pipelines. One was a match filter with models. So they have different models of uh, mass for uh, black holes, and they were just correlating the data with this signal coming from the models. And then they had the wavelets discovery technique, but the wavelets had no model. And what happened first is it found the signal with wavelets, but not with the match filtering. And the reason why is because the mass of the black hole was much higher than anything which was expected. So the so one pipeline we had a model, which had the model, completely missed the signal, which was quite strong. But wavelets could find it. So I would say that if you want to be open to completely new discovery and new features. It's also good to have unsupervised approach uh, like wavelets or any uh, similar techniques where you can have any signal. If it's like off even for you, if it's strong enough, you will find it. No, I, I, I fully agree with you. It's not that I'm advocating in favor of, you know, sort of like a prior or a Bayesian approach, right? The only, uh, I one, uh, like a very senior astronomer who was uh, probably 20 years, 25 years older than we are, he hated Bayesian, saying that in the good old days, we used to call that gut feeling. The fact that you, you believe that something is there, you put it in the priors and you will find it, right? Because you tweak your priors towards your uh, kind of understanding, right? While uh, the, the, only, the only sort of like, not advantage uh, that I see in the, even in the wavelets, right? Or even in a Bayesian approach is that you, you, you sort of like know implicitly, you know your prior or you, you, you have a feeling on your bias, right? 
if you if you put the if you put a sinusoidal decomposition in Fourier, you know that you are very sensitive in detecting periodicities and not step functions, right? So similarly, if you in, if you have a Bayesian technique, the, the, the only uh, uneasiness that I have, which may be the conservative approach, as you said, is that if you if the big data that we, we will be getting down the road will force us to go into deep learning because there is no other way, right? Because you have huge data and that's the only way to interpret them or to analyze them, then uh, uh, possibly we need possibly a technique needs to be developed to double check uh, unknown biases that may creep if you go to low signal to noise detection, if that's all. Yeah, so people are evolving. You see, in the 20th century, Rutherford considered that uh, we should never use any statistics, right? Uh, if you need statistics, then you then it's not science, right? So, mm -hmm. was, so people are people are evolving, and uh, so people were really against Bayesian approach, and uh, but nobody now is discussing anymore that uh, Bayesian approach for finding the cosine of parameters uh, in the front in the lambda CDM framework is the right thing to do. You, you can investigate by other technique as well, but if you want to know what are the parameters in the Bayesian framework, then that's mm -hmm. the right thing to do. If you have millions of millions of parameters, then indeed the Bayesian techniques are not necessarily the best. So it really depends on the problem in which framework, what, how good is the model, um, but obviously the solution depends on the model. So you have to be careful, but there is no, no reason why you should not believe Bayesian techniques. You have, you have to know that the solution is model dependent and it will be the same for the deep learning techniques. Okay, uh, thank you very much. There is also, I see a question by uh, Evie. I don't know if she has a microphone or not. She says just the question, do you use a physical model to optimize the weights and the biases of the neural network? Okay, that's a, also a very, very good question. So for instance, in one, okay, I didn't show he, this here, but if you want, for instance, to focus on the shape of the galaxy, of the ellipticity, so you can make a training of the neural network where in the loss function, you, you add some constraints on the ellipticity. So it's a way to use the physics that you are interested in, uh, in order to optimize the weight of the, uh, of the neural network. So the, the answer is yes, this can be done quite easily using the uh, uh, during the training set in the loss function. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. If there are no more questions, uh, then uh, I would like to thank on behalf of all of us and look for taking the time to prepare this talk for us. And we all look forward to having him again in Crete in a couple of months. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Luc.